Today I've decided to get back to my roots with an old school motherboard unboxing and overview video because not only is this the first Asus Impact small form factor motherboard in quite some time, but it is definitely the first Asus RG Impact AMD motherboard on the AM4 chipset, but it is also my first ever small form factor motherboard that is not mini ITX, but mini DTX. Excellent! The Hydro X series is Corsair's new line of custom cooling parts built for the world's most powerful and stunning systems. They've gone all out with CPU and graphics card water blocks, pump reservoir combos, fittings, tubing, radiators, and coolant, providing you with everything you need to build a spectacular custom cooling loop that lowers system temperatures and improves performance, complete with vivid RGB lighting. Click the sponsor link in the video description to learn more. So a good unboxing video should at least dwell briefly on the box itself. So we have ROG Crosshair 8 Impact. Crosshair is the ROG name for AMD motherboards. Impact is the ROG Small Form Factor, previously Mini ITX motherboard series, but now also Mini DTX. And 8, of course, is the series. They, this is the eighth generation of Crosshair motherboards. It supports AMD Ryzen processors, specifically third gen Ryzen processors. It supports the X570 chipset, which does require some active cooling on this board. It has a really cool SO DIMM.2 feature that lets you install extra M.2 NVMe drives to the board, or a sync compatibility for RGB game first, which probably makes your games faster, and ASUS node compatible as well, as PCI Express Gen 4 support, and that's thanks to this being a Ryzen 3rd Gen series motherboard, although I should point out it's only going to give you PCI Express Gen 4 if you use a 3000 series or Ryzen 3rd Gen processor. Opening up the box, and we have this extra flap that holds the box lid on, which is... That, does that qualify as origami? Probably not. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We should look at the back of the box too. Integrated active cooling. Uh, we also have a back plate. We also have that SO DIMM.2 Supreme FX Impact 4 audio, and that's uh, thanks to a riser card that's on the board. Bunch of other specs and features listed here. The one I will point out is it's got integrated Intel Wi-Fi 6. That's 802.11ax Wi-Fi. It's a two by two setup with Mumimo support as well as Bluetooth 5.0. Getting back to this unboxing experience. And uh, this is a sample board that was sent to me directly by Asus. So big thanks to them for doing that. It's also a board that they said they did a, a little something something with the IO shield for just to correct things, which I believe is why this is brushing up against the plastic, which led to a little bit of plastic residue on that. Not a big deal. Here's the board itself. We'll get to that in just a moment. Also in the box, we have a CD. Really? Still have CDs? Okay. We have, of course, an ROG coaster, which everyone should have. Other documentation, box O accessories, and then the ever important SO DIMM.2 riser card, which also has some uh, fan headers on it. Documentation wise, we have the, the Crosshair 8 Impact User's Guide here. A uh, special thanks to purchasing an ROG product. You've made the choice of champions and you've paid more money than you would have for a non ROG product, but that's because it's quality paying for quality here, folks, and this set of awesome stickers. Uh, stickers you may or may not be interested in. These do feel like nice stickers, and there are some sort of useful stickers in these little SATA tags over here. If you have lots of SATA devices, you're supposed to use these on either end of it, and then you can tell which cable is going which direction. Can actually be helpful in some situations. We also have battery stickers. Oh, you put those over your battery to hide your battery, the, the hideous, ugly battery that otherwise would be visible. This is making me think that I haven't taken a close look at these stickers sets that they've given out in quite some time. I shouldn't just write them off as, as useless. They are somewhat useful. Uh, useless is, is a, a CD for drivers, but I guess maybe that's gonna be helpful for you. If you live in an environment where you, this is your only computer that you're setting up and you have no other internet access otherwise, and your Windows installation doesn't recognize the, the internet on here, then you could get an external USB CD reader and load the network drivers off of this. I, uh, that's probably a stretch case, but running down accessories, we have four SATA cables. That's pretty standard. We have the ever important but also very easy to lose uh, little screws and mounting hardware for your uh, SO DIMM.2 slots. There's a little, ru little rubber pad there for something. I'm not exactly sure what. They've given you an extender here for your front panel I.O., which is very useful, especially in small form factor builds. You can plug this block into the motherboard and that gives you some uh, breakout blocks to plug uh, your power LED and reset switches into. I just wish this was all black cabling. It's kind of a bright uh, mashup of colors there that might be visible if you use it, but at least it's there. We we have an external antenna for our 802.11ax Wi-Fi. We have a couple RGB header extension cables. One's just your standard three pin and the other one is the three pin over to the uh, other type of plug that some RGB LEDs like to use. And then we have this glorious device right here, which is our SO DIMM.2 riser card. 
So on the motherboard itself, directly above the PCIe expansion slot, you have this little uh, slot right here. And this is an SO DIMM slot. They've used the same type of plug that they use in SO DIMM memory modules, which is a type of memory modules that go into laptops. It's smaller. It's basically a smaller footprint. You still have standard uh, memory slots over here for your standard uh, DDR4 memory, but the SO DIMM.2 slot, you, you also could not accidentally plug uh, an SO DIMM actual memory module in here because they put a little blocker across there and that's just to make sure if you're plugging something in, it's actually separated there because it's not wired up for memory. It's wired up to allow you to connect a couple M.2 drives. This is my first attempt at installing it, but hopefully I can figure this out. There we go. And uh, just like a memory module, it's got the little side clasps that grab on and give it a bit firmer feel when it's actually plugged in. It does stand up off the board a decent amount. I'm not sure if you're going to have any conflict if you're using an air cooler over here on the actual AM4 slot, for example. But it is going to allow you to install two M.2 drives right there. It's going to get them up and off and away from the board, which is uh, often useful because it allows for better cooling on M.2 drives. It's also got a piece of plastic here I'm going to peel off. The riser card itself has two, uh, I believe these are aluminum plates that do seem to act as heat sinks, at least to some degree. They've got some thermal pads uh, on the bottom of them, at least, that are supposed to go up against your M.2 drives. Those are each held on with three screws. They have sort of a brushed metal finish on the top, which looks kind of nice. And then that leaves you with the PCB below it, which is seems to me is all about preserving, maintaining, or making the best use of real estate that's available. Because and my assumption is when they decided to do an SO DIMM.2 riser, they realized Realize that the length of an M.2 drive is a little bit longer than the SO DIMM slot itself, so they were going to need to expand the PCB to go a little bit wider to support your standard M.2 lengths. 2280 is the most standard one, at least that I've seen. But then they're also taking advantage of some of this extra space on here by wiring up a couple uh, more fan headers. Those are four pin PWM fan headers, as well as another three pin five volt addressable RGB LED header. As you can see though, uh, just standard M.2 drive goes in like so. You probably want to install the mounting hardware right there to hold it in place. Cover goes on top, helps keep it cool. Install that on your board, you're good to go. M.2 storage, hooray. Uh, the other nice thing about this is that with it installed on top like this, although granted you're talking about a small form factor build, so it might not be the easiest to get at, but it's certainly more accessible than if it was installed down here beneath the graphics card, and definitely more accessible than if it were installed on the back of your motherboard, where as you can see here, there's a pretty cool motherboard backplate. You don't often get a backplate with your motherboard. And now of course, the motherboard itself, which is it's so small, but it's mini DTX. And if you're wondering just what the specific difference is, mini DTX to mini ITX, uh, hopefully if I hold these up side by side, you should just be able to tell. It's a bit taller, isn't it? Standard Mini ITX motherboard is about seven inches by seven inches. Uh, Mini DTX just takes advantage of the bit of extra vertical space that would often be covered up by a graphics card anyway. And from my understanding, that is sort of the MO with this type of motherboard is that most systems that are gonna install a graphics card there are installing a two slot card. So if you're gonna be covering up that space, you might as well give a little bit more PCB room to work with. So we're gonna take a closer look at what ASUS has actually done with that extra space. But here's a quick side-by-side -side comparison uh, with the Crosshair 8 Impact on the left, and a Z370-i Gaming from ASUS's Intel lineup on the right. And you can see, size difference, pretty straightforward there. Other features though, in no particular order, include fixed IO shield, which is just one of those things that's really nice and I hope just becomes a standard after some time. And you look at old motherboards that don't have a fixed IO shield and be like, why did they ever not include that in a fixed sort of fashion? For IO on the back, they're giving you a lot to work with. We have a couple USB 3.0 ports, a couple super speed 10 gigabit ports here, USB 3.1 Gen 2 or USB 3.2 Gen 2.2 or whatever they're calling it. You got SPDIF out for the audio as well as gold plated mic in and line out and line in ports here for uh, eighth inch. Four more 10 gigabit USB 3.1 Gen 2 ports here. The one that's highlighted with BIOS over it means that you have USB BIOS flashback support with this motherboard, which is a really nice feature. One of those is a type C port as well. You've got gigabit ethernet integrated and then your uh, connection points for your 802.11ax Wi-Fi antenna. You have an externally mounted reset button as well as a Q code readout for debugging stuff. If you're having any issues getting the system up and running, or I imagine that's gonna be really helpful for overclockers. And then you also have an externally mounted BIOS 
flashback button as well as a clear CMOS button. All extremely helpful and useful things to have externally on the board that you would not necessarily be able to access on some other boards that have it mounted to the board itself inside. But that's not to say there's nothing mounted to the board itself as well. You actually have a surface mounted start button or a surface mounted power button here, which is something that you rarely see with Mini ITX or Mini DTX motherboards now as well. Looking at the board itself though, we can see the AM4 socket right here in the middle and it looks like they've uh, done a good job clearing space out around that depending on the size of your air cooler or the amount for your liquid cooler if you're going that route. And you can maybe see over on this side, this is just sort of a stair step metal piece that's going down to help provide cooling for the VRMs and the power delivery. And it also extends down here because the chipset is actually mounted beneath on this side right here. They brought all that stuff over so they could keep it roughly in the same spot so that they could attach a pretty beefy cooling solution to it that actually also has a couple active fans mounted in there that look to be pretty small. I'm not gonna speculate as to the size of those fans, but they look to be 60 millimeter or smaller. I just said I'm not gonna speculate and then I speculated. It's fine. That's you, all right? <laughs> It's fine. Speaking of keeping things grouped up, I love what they've done with this edge of the board because they've got both your 24 pin and your eight pin power connectors right next to each other. So routing cables over to those, it's gonna look very nice, clean and tidy and also just ease up your cable management. It's often very challenging to route an eight pin over to somewhere like here, or I've seen it mounted. I've seen them even over in this area, which is just poor design. We also have the USB 3.0 port next to our 3.1 Gen 2 front panel connector. Happy that that's there because uh, the case I'm going to be installing this in the Lian Li TU 150 actually does have that. And there's no mini ITX motherboards, at least on the AMD side, that also have that port. So this one now has it and I'll be able to plug that in. You get four SATA ports over here, uh, two that are vertical and two that are horizontal. And then down at the bottom, you see they've wedged even more functionality down in here. We have a safe boot as well as a retry button. There's an on off switch there and uh, to be perfectly honest, I'm not even sure what that is connected up to. We have a couple more fan headers right there, a three pin next to a four pin. There's an addressable five volt uh, RGB LED header. Uh, and then for both a USB, just a standard USB 2.0 header, as well as your front panel header, as well as the uh, Asus node connector right there, they've actually angled them and rotated them so that depending on the case you have these connected to, you can plug them in going off to the side. So I imagine in some situations that might actually be uh, detrimental if you're dealing with the power supply or something like that that's right up against the bottom. But in a lot of situations, I think it's gonna be better to have it going that way because again, that's potentially conflicting with a graphics card that you have plugged in right there. And if you've got a couple fan headers and then other stuff plugged in, it's just gonna be helpful to have that stuff going sideways rather than up potentially conflicting with your graphics card. Moving along right here, we have what looks like an M.2 slot cover, but that's actually just a riser board for some of the components that are in the Supreme FX audio solution that uh, Asus has put together. And those are of course, wired up to the audio in and outs on the back of the motherboard. You can get a bit of a look from the side at the capacitors and some of the other audio components that are integrated there. Um, but Asus has done this in the past and used a riser board for their audio. It also helps separate some of that electrically from the rest of the power planes uh, that are integrated into the PCB of the main motherboard itself. So I wanted to add a little bit of extra for this unboxing and overview video. So I've gone ahead and done some disassembly of the Crosshair 8 Impact because there are lots of extra pieces that are attached to this motherboard, both on the top, specifically with the cooling assembly for the VRMs, which is pretty substantial and has a couple fans integrated into it. Those are 30 millimeter fans, by the way, correction from earlier when I speculated they might be 60 millimeter. With that removed though, we can actually see the power delivery area. We can actually see the X570 chipset and where Asus positioned that in a pretty brilliant place in my my opinion. And we can also see the full back of the motherboard uh, with that back plate removed. Speaking of the back plate, it is not a passive back plate. There actually is a little bit of extra added in there. There's a heat pipe integrated that goes behind the power delivery area. And there's a bit of extra thermal padding there above a couple of the power stages for the SOC power delivery. Now the power delivery on this board is actually controlled by this little tiny chip right up here, uh, which can handle eight phases. However, if you have two phases for the SOC, that only leaves six phases for the V-Core and uh, they've decided to go ahead and use four of those phases and then run two power stages and chokes per phase. Now, I know this information because I hit up Buildzoid from his channel, Actually Hardcore Overclocking. Uh, I offered to bribe him with pictures, close-ups of the PCB on this board so he could do one of his PCB analysis videos. He said he already had those pictures, a fan sent them into him, which is really nice, but he still went ahead and sent me a little blurb on his opinions of the power delivery setup for this board. And here's what he had to say. It is a four-phase V-Core with a two-phase SOC. Uh, you can see two of the chokes for the SOC power delivery up there on top. To get the same efficiency as an eight-phase, Asus is running two 
two power stages and chokes in parallel in each of the V-Core phases. The power stages for the V-Core and SOC, which you may be able to see, there's a couple of them right here. And then there's actually a couple of the same ones on the back of the board, and that's for the SOC. But these are TDA 21472s, which are 70 amp smart power stages from International Rectifier or Infineon. So to sum up, Buildzoid said, as far as power throughput for the VRMs, it's really good, better than a lot of ATX boards. The rather low phase count means that Asus needs to compensate for it with adjustments to the rest of their design, which Buildzoid is gonna go into when he does his more in-depth PCB analysis video. So I'll put a link to his channel in the video description and be sure to check that out. But then he also noted that the bulk of the capacitance for power delivery to the V-Core is handled by these surface mount capacitors right along here. And these are SMD aluminum polymer capacitors that are superior to the through hole ones you normally see on ATX motherboards. Those are the more barrel style capacitors like you can see right here. And through hole means that the, when they mount, they go through the motherboard to the terminals that you can see on the bottom side. These are superior to the through hole variant. So basically he says, it's a very good VRM. Beyond that, I just wanted to take a closer look at this little assembly itself beyond the dual 30 millimeter fans that are attached to it, which does actually provide a huge improvement in cooling uh, for something like this, as opposed to passive cooling. You have finned heat sinks directly below them. And that's also uh, the best method for heat dissipation, especially when you're dealing with a very small footprint like this. And then I just really like how they've managed to maintain a huge amount of area around the socket while still maintaining a bunch of contact with the VRM power delivery components themselves, as well as this nice flat spot here, which interfaces with the X570 chip. And we know from all of the full-size ATX motherboards that are out there, this X570 chip does require some cooling. So, so having that all integrated into this same heat sink with a couple fans, I think is a great way to go about it. Nasus has done a great job with this design. And I guess they agree with that assessment because I finally heard the asking price for this motherboard, not specifically, but it's going to be around $400. US. That's a that's a lot for a, a mini board like this, but it really does have a lot of the same features that you get with a full-size ATX board. So looking at this board, I think ASUS has made a lot of good decisions when it comes to making the best use out of the space they have available. And that's really important when you're talking about a small form factor system. And especially if you're trying to cram as much as you can into a motherboard that's a little bit larger than seven inches by seven inches when you're typically using something that's ATX size, which is much larger. There are some potential downsides to the board as well though that uh, should be pointed out. One, of course, is just gonna be the fact that it's mini DTX rather than mini ITX. ASUS is claiming that this will fit in a lot of existing mini ITX cases that already have enough space for a dual slot graphics card, but that will need to be determined on a case by case basis pun is slightly intentional there. And I know there will be some that it just doesn't fit in or it doesn't fit comfortably in. And fitting comfortably is also somewhat important. But it is the best mini motherboard that Asus is planning to make on this platform. So I guess you typically have to pay a premium for that. So hopefully the price will make sense to some people who want to build an insane system with like a 3900X or especially with the upcoming 3950X wedging that 16 core processor into a system this small, I imagine will be pretty impressive for people who are going for that balance between small size, big performance. But that I think is pretty much all I have to say about this motherboard for now, but I am going to be installing this like later today in that Lian Li TU150 case and I will be doing a follow-up video on that build testing it and showing you some comparative numbers and uh, whatever else you find interesting so if you guys have any suggestions for me leave those down in the comment section down below as far as what you'd like to see me do with this motherboard before I go though one last big thank you to Buildzoid for jumping in here and giving us a little bit of an analysis of the PCB here and of course make sure you stop by and check out his full PCB analysis video once it's available I'll post a link to his channel down in the video's description thank you guys so much for watching this video, hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed it, and we'll see you guys next time.